What is up? What is up? What is up, everybody? Let us fire it up. I'm going to get so owned in this game. It's time that we get to the Steam Top 50 and seeing what the latest trends are. Gary's mod. There's TF2. It's usually around somewhere. Woo! Oh, snakes. Does it just have really high retention? This genre is still viable. I just got to shoot his butt. There was kind of a trend for a while. Like, that is just the way things work. We did it! Happy New Year, chums. Welcome to the Clark Tank. Good to see you all again. Happy 2019. This time of year is always a really good time. There's the IGF nominees are announced. Steam always posts, you know, the best of the year. And there's actually been some recent uh, happenings with apparently now you can kind of tell uh, sales stats for PlayStation games. Not sure how long that will last, but we can talk about that. It's always exciting uh, time of year for, for indies, especially those who submitted to the IGF. And it's always like super exciting and a, and a proud moment when you when you get the get a nomination. So congrats to everybody. Well, let's let's go over the uh, the nominees here. So Minute, it's very innovative and cool and clever. Uh, so I'm glad to see that one getting a nod for sure. Kind of surprised that Subnautica only seemed to get honorable mentions. Yeah, Elznik, I agree. That is a bit strange. You know, this is a, a jury that makes these decisions, right? I think if it were a popular vote, then maybe Subnautica would uh, would be in there because that game has sold a ton of copies and it's an amazing game, of course, as well. So yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, if subconsciously people are thinking uh, that, you know, maybe those other games kind of need it more. But Noita, is Noita even out yet? So this is Petri Perho, a uh, super cool guy, and he's been hibernating or maybe working on this for a while and yeah I haven't seen him much since and now he's popping up with with Noita which looks super cool it's like exactly made for me roguelike and you know physics-y simulation stuff it's so good that's the return of Oberdin <clears throat> we is nominated I think like five times and I think it's not in Nuovo and not in student game so it couldn't have possibly been nominated for a student game you know five is enough Lucas Pope <laughs> But yeah, clearly super well deserved. If you guys do not know about Oberdin, you should check it out. Uh, so yeah, Hypnospace Outlaw. It's uh, some kind of adventurish looking game with 90s uh, inspired graphics, which is super cool. Now, do not feed the monkeys. I do not know what this is about. Unique digital voyeur simulator. Okay, I've never even heard of this. Oh, so it's like a life sim, but you have to get progress of, of spying on people. Feed the monkeys. That's a strange title because it does not, it's not immediately obvious what the game is from that title. Honorable mention to Wander Song by my friend uh, Greg and, um, and Gord and Ems. Congrats to them for the honorable mention. I know they got an actual nomination as well down below. Subnautica, we already talked about Mirror Drop. What is that? Mirror Drop. Is this a mobile game or a VR game? Looks kind of VR ish. Seems to imply that the user is somehow moving the ball around, but how? The interface is not clear. <clears throat> Looks real trippy, yes. Interesting. Okay, so that one got a uh, honorable mention for grand prize. Moss. Unavowed. I'm aware of this one. I think they got a nomination as well. Iconoclast is a, a gorgeous looking game that I still have not played. Um, Paul Veer is, is always... Uh, saying that everyone should play it and it's super amazing. My only problem with it is that I think I understand what kind of game it is and usually I play games to understand more about you know new game design ideas and things like that so it's not as different as some other games that I might play. And Beat Saber, I'm kind of surprised that Beat Saber didn't get like a full nomination because Beat Saber is like the VR game probably like ever definitely of 2018. It's the most fun one, in my opinion. Perhaps because it's quite simple, like the concept is not really that uh, involved, but holy smokes, does it does it work well. And there have been other games similar, like um, Audio Shield, which also is fun, but not as much fun, in my opinion, as Beat Saber. So, excellence in visual art, Forgotten Anne. I'm not aware of this one, let's check it out. We'll have to go. Yeah, these like fully animated cutscene things are pretty amazing. Man? How do they have the budget for I this? I guess it's uh, Square here. Square Enix. Why would you give me yeah, it's true, Larkin. Some parts look Ghibli and some parts don't. It's like that, man. That is super Ghibli. I'm sure on purpose. 
a pretty impressive effort from those folks. Um, and yeah, it said there was a Square Enix collective, and yet it's still considered indie. I wonder what being a part of the Square Enix collective really, really means. I'm not actually sure. Uh, all right, Alto's Odyssey. What's this one about? Very nice art style. Oh, doing sweet tricks. Uh, just Shapes and Beats is uh, by Berserk Studio. Awesome folks out of Quebec. I'm still working on Just Shapes and Beats. <laughs> <laughs> They brought this game to so many PAXs and stuff like that. They have such good awareness, and I was so happy to see the game doing well when they launched. They they deserved it. Uh, Mirror Drop, so that's the one that we uh, checked up here. It had the honorable mention for Grand Prize. Uh, Return of Oberdin, of course. Uh, honorable mention for Beat Saber again. Huh, for visual art? That's a bit surprising. Like, the art is good, but it's not, you know, the, the core part of the game. Uh, cool to see Wandersong get a... a Honorable mention as well for visual art. You know, Greg worked hard on that, and it's got such a unique style. Subnautica again. How many? How many honorable mentions is Subnautica going to get? Uh, Moss. All right, we didn't watch the trailer for Moss. I'm curious about that. Wow, this would require so much effort to make this game. Holy smokes! Wow, this is a VR game. They they this much effort went into a VR game. Moss is definitely triple I indie. Yeah, well, this level of quality could not be made by a small team. Yeah, impressive. That's this goes to show the uh, the quality of the games that are that are nominated these days. These ones are getting nominated for they're getting uh, honorable mentions instead of actual nominations. It's pretty crazy. Guildlings, let's check this out. Really like the art style. Yeah, I guess that's why it's got the honorable mention for visual art. So excellence in audio. This is usually where there's things that I've never heard of uh, because. Games can be nominated for excellence in audio because of, you know, uh, audio-based gameplay and things like that. Not necessarily because the the uh, the game sold well or is, has a ton of awareness, but just they're doing something really innovative with audio. I'm not aware of Ethereal. Hypnospace Outlaw we, we saw in Moss. Oh, it's good that Moss, so it didn't get a nomination for uh, a Grand Prize or Visual Art, but it got one for audio, so they, they got one. Oberdin, of course. Alto's Audio, or Alto's Odyssey. <laughs> Must have good audio. Uh, and Paratropic. Okay, let's watch this one because it also got a uh, honorable mention. What is this? It was like PS1 graphics? It was... <laughs> Why would they include that at the end? It's structured a bit like 30 Flights 11. Oh, okay, that's cool. I love that game. Uh, so excellence in design. What the golf? Do not feed the monkeys, we already saw. Noita, I'm, again, super pumped for that one. Dicey Dungeons, oh, I've heard about this. Chipsel is the greatest. Terry Kavanaugh is awesome. I am not sure, I don't know Marlo. Let's check this out though. This is her art, cool. So if it's anything like Yahtzee, like you, you, you Yahtzee, but Yahtzee RPG, I am gonna be all over it, I love Yahtzee. Uh, and Opus Magnum also got excellence in design. Honorable mention again, Subnautica Carto. I don't know that one. Black Room Jump Grid. Mirror Drop Into Space and Beat Saber again. Dang, poor Beat Saber. Uh, excellence in narrative, Wander Song, yes. Uh, genital jousting. Uh, you may not think it, you know, looking at the game, uh, but he talked about how, you know, they tried to Trojan horse the, you know, dick jokes, but you know, stick inside the Trojan horse of dick jokes, uh, you know, progressive ideas, and then get that into the gamer consciousness. So yeah, check out that talk if you're interested. If you're wondering why is genital jousting, you know, excellence in narrative, check that out. Uh, unavowed, so let's let's take a look at this. This genre is kind of niche, but they've managed to, uh, um, you know, be successful catering to that niche with super well-made games. And this trailer starts out with an interesting hook. They get you curious about, you know, what's happening to you? Why are you doing all these evil deeds? Stuff like that. So yeah, great to see this one get a nod. <coughs> Sears Isle. Watch me jump. That doesn't sound like a, uh, a narrative game. And yeah, Oberdin, of course. Now Nuovo. Nth Dimensional Hiking. Is this like sexy hiking? Okay, maybe we'll watch this one. But I, I love the IGF. It's near and dear to my heart. Without it, I don't think... Uh, 
I would still be making games. It uh, brought a lot of attention to some of our early games when we were just a small, struggling indie studio at Grubby Games. See, I, I owe a lot to the IGF. Wow, this is trippy. Nth dimensional hiking. N nothing like sexy hiking at all. Well, congrats to all the nominees. There's a bunch of uh, awesome student games too. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna go and play them all at GDC. So if if you were one of the nominated folks, see you in a couple months. And congratulations to everyone. Just looking through the IGF website. Interesting that entries are slightly down since 2016. Oh. That is interesting. So 2018, there was 585 games. 2017, 670. 2016, 774. So was the peak 2016? I wonder what that means. Because it certainly wasn't 2016 the peak of, you know, games being launched on Steam. So maybe people are just not aware of IGF or don't think that it's worth the $100 or whatever the submission price is you know, an IGF nomination, I don't think it itself is going to get you a ton of visibility, but it allows you to put, you know, the laurels, the accolades on your uh, store page, your Steam store page, and on your trailers and things like that. And congratulations to everyone. Uh, this time of year, Valve always releases um, a lot of information about what was going on on their platform during the year. So top sellers versus top new releases is interesting because sometimes there are games in the top sellers that are very old, such as, you know, GTA and things like that, that are not new releases, but they're still selling. Uh, so we should check out those two. Uh, all right, top sellers. So these are not necessarily games that came out this year, just the ones that sold the best on Steam. So now Warframe, congrats to the team for uh, their building success. There aren't too many games that climb and climb and climb like they've managed to do. Rocket League still, still strong. <clears throat> and I think I saw numbers for Rocket League on PS4 that surprised me. That game is like a monstrous, uh, monstrous success. Civ 6, I don't think Civ 6, yeah, it came out in 2016. It's still in the top, still in platinum. That's impressive. Stellaris, you know, still performing strong years later. It's like the, the 4X genre, the strategy genre is viable. That's why, you know, we're making Industries of Titan uh, and Phantom Brigade as well. A Raft, this one, um, is new 2018 did quite well tf2 i'm surprised that it's this far down dying light yes uh subnautica i thought it would be in the goldish but uh dragon ball fighters east this came out in 2018 i thought it would be a bit higher but still good to see fighting games on pc doing well uh bronze are there any surprising ones in here cool to see darkest dungeon launched in 2016 still in bronze uh battletech just launched last year did pretty well, 6,000 reviews. Like it's, those sales are good for an indie team, but for a, uh, I imagine their team is much larger than your average indie team. Um, so hope it, hope it continues to do well for those folks. I'm a bit surprised to see their billions not higher because in my mind, I think of that as, as one of the big indie hits of 2018. Uh, Dark Stungeon had a content update. Yeah, they've been supporting it and then doing DLC and things like that for quite a while, so. So yeah, not too surprising to see it still doing well, and it's and it is an amazing game, of course. Uh, and Don't Starve is also a, a juggernaut, still doing well, and, and Factorio, NBA 2K19, despite you know always having horrible reviews, doing well. I would have thought Human Fall Flat would have been higher as well because it seemed to be in the charts a lot, but you know, still being in the charts at all after being um, out since 2016 is impressive. Uh, so Surviving Mars is interesting for us at Brace Yourself Games because Industries of Titan is somewhat in the same genre, you know, a, a sci-fi builder strategy game. Um, so good to see it in the charts. Is Gary's Mod in here? Where is it? Slay the Spire also. I would have to expect that Slay the Spire and They Are Billions are both near the top of bronze. The fact that Slay the Spire most of its lifetime was 2018, it only came out at the end of 2017, and such a huge hit, I thought. A bit surprised to not see it higher than bronze. Probably a million copies, probably more than a million copies in a year or so, and not above bronze. Surprising to me. Deep Rock Galactic, it's cool to see that in here. Gary's Mod! Still in the charts. 2006! The freaking game. And yeah, House Flipper was a surprise success. 7,000 reviews, and it only came out partway through the year. It just goes to show that, like, your typical, you know, sort of grim, dark 
roguelikes or RPGs or FPSs and stuff that you expect to find a home on on Steam, there it's still possible for other completely new genres to to succeed, which is which is great. All right, so that is the top sellers of 2018. So let's contrast that with top new releases. Uh, there's going to be a lot more variety here. Games that we haven't been seeing for years on the charts, like Gary's Mod. You can't be in this list, Gary's Mod. New releases, and this is by month, so we can't really tell what the cutoff is. Uh, some of these months, I, I took a peek at this earlier, have way more games than others, like April has hardly any. Trailmakers. It looks like a pod racing kind of. Trailmakers are like Minecraft Lego cars. Oh. Gary's Mod, but with pre-made races and multiplayer, easier to do. Okay. Well, that's, <laughs> that's a wise thing to do. If you know, if a game like Gary's Mod is still selling this many years later, like, there's got to be a reason. So analyzing it and taking, you know, a chunk of it and, and polishing it up, making that chunk a better experience is not a, not a bad idea. The disappearing of Gen Sokyo. I've not heard of a lot of these. All right, there's Arcana class that we talked a lot about. Railway Empire. So yeah, building games, um, tycoon games, still definitely viable on Steam. My time at Porsche, I think we talked about um, on the Clark Tank before. So Staxel, good to see our friend Bart's game, uh, launched in January, was one of the best of that month. Uh, Dragon Ball Fighter Z, man, it only has 8,000 reviews. That's surprising. I guess it's an expensive game, but... Um, Celeste, the huge indie hit of 2018. Um, 5,000 reviews in one year is a ton. I think Necrodancer has 10,000 in however many years, so they got that far in uh, a year. Fishing, Barrent Sea. So is this like a, wow, you actually have to gut the fish? Dungreed, Dungreed? I wanna see the trailer for this. Huh, reminds me a little bit of Catacomb Kids. The high-res stuff is pretty sweet. Great pixel art. And the UI stuff is pretty impressive. Farm together. Okay, so this is like a farming simulator, but not the German style. That's what we should call like the serious sims, a German style. And then this is like a rancher style, right? Like um, Harvest Moon style looking sort of thing. The graphics are cuter. 3,000 reviews, uh, only launched in this October. That is impressive. So yeah, I, I do think that rancher style, both German style and rancher style uh, farming sims are, are totally still viable on Steam, if, you're, if your uh, scope is correct. Into the Breach, of course. It's also got 4,000, almost 5,000 reviews already in, in less than a year, so this game is doing extremely well. Congrats to the subset, guys. Uh, yeah, Rise of Industry. Now, I'm a bit surprised that this game hasn't done better. I remember when it was, I think it was in alpha on its website only, and I was like, that's the type of game that does well on Steam. And not that it's doing poorly, a thousand reviews in a year is still really good. My general money to be impression named. of Steam is that this genre is viable. Um, so why did this game not do so well? Choose from the yeah, I've heard, I think, some other folks uh, I know here in Vancouver have said that, you know, it's the, it's got the trappings of, the, of, you know, what you would want, but the actual gameplay is not as as compelling. It, it, it looks like the type of game that would succeed on Steam, but I suppose, you know, it still needs to actually do all the things that people want from, uh, from Tycoon Games. Yeah, all right. So then I won't change my opinion that this genre is really viable, because I, I do think that it is. You just have to, you know, study the other games that have been successful in that in that genre and figure out, you know, what they did well, uh, and make sure you're doing those things well too. And yeah, UI of this type of game is is pretty key. Those games are like all UI. We were here too, huh? This this is the typical sort of uh, dark, Steam RPG ish game. No, it's puzzle. What? Okay, okay, we got to check this out. You have to play co-op? If it's co-op only, I'm surprised that it sold, you know, a thousand reviews worth. Co-op only? How could it sell this well if it's co-op only? Can you play online with like randos that you don't know? People do love online multi, but usually 
from what I've heard from other devs, especially, you know, devs of, of strategy games and things like that, maybe 5-10% of the people who buy their game actually use online multi, whereas this, like, you have to. So if it's true that, you know, 5-10% of people, uh, and like 90-95% of people prefer to play single player, then that drastically reduces your audience size. Yeah, I guess streamers could have something to do with it. It is a game that you could play with another one of your streamer friends, and if it is really good, like I imagine it must be quite good if it's if it's done this well, then streamers will play it a lot and, and a lot of folks will be aware of it. I think it is really neat. It's good to see that this is uh, viable. Like a lot of people uh, are concerned or complain that, that uh, the industry these days is, you know, you gotta, it's hit driven and you gotta make a certain kind of game in order to succeed, but look at that. That's great. That's great news for us as indies. Ghost of a Tale. This is another mouse-based... <laughs> you're a mouse. Pixar, yeah, did did uh, reasonably well. Well, mixed reviews. Now, Heroes of Hammerwatch, didn't this come out... Was it in early access? I thought this came out a long time ago. So yeah, the other thing we can look at is like... Is there some reason why... Not too many successful indie game launches in January. Quite a few in February. I do think that there's a lot of indies try to avoid... Christmas and pre-Christmas time, so they're not competing with AAA, which I'm not sure if that's really um, a thing that you should do or not, but obviously a lot of people do. So February is a big month, perhaps because of that. March, there's uh, there's GDC, and then there tends to be PAX East, April, you know, the, uh, PAX East is usually March, April time frame. Um, but yeah, a bit surprised to see so few in April. So maybe if you're launching, uh, April would be a, a good month. Frostpunk, huge hit this year, 20,000 reviews, and yeah, only been out for two-thirds of the year or so. So many good things about this game. When I first played it, like, when you see the little people walking through the snow and leaving their indents in the snow, had such a big impact, like, in the first minute of gameplay. Um, uh, the theme, you know, just the, the way the gameplay meshes with the theme is extremely impressive and inspiring. You like my op optimism, Wyloon? Well, thanks. There's, uh... I was gonna say, there's no point in being pessimistic. You should try to be realistic, of course, but you should always try to find... You know, the the silver lining, the, the ways that we can still succeed. Because, yeah, things are tough. Uh, but I've always said, things are way better now than they were in 20, 2004, when I started. Um, you can always find a time period that was worse, and you can probably always find one that was better. But all you can do is analyze what's going on right now, like this, what we're doing, uh, and you know make the best decisions going forward. So that's why we uh, that's why we do the Clark Tank. I don't really think that indies compete with each other that much, um, and yet they were they were giving us all kinds of uh, uh, tips and advice and, and helpful suggestions. It was very cool. So yeah, it's one of the reasons why I love making games and being an indie is that we all can help each other like we're doing right now. Uh, Wizard of Legend, yeah. We talked about this a lot in the Kickstarter report. Uh, backed it. Such a cool game. Uh, Beat Saber! Still a bit bummed that Beat Saber didn't get any kind of nomination in the IGF, but... <clears throat> I think they're crying all the way to the bank. You know, uh... I, I can't believe it only came out this year. Like, almost 10,000 reviews. This is a huge hit. Like, it's gotta be the... The biggest... Uh, VR game of all. House Flipper we were talking about. Now, Cultist Simulator is really interesting. Let's watch the trailer for this. And yeah, it's one of the few games where it's it seems like it's producing an entirely new kind of gameplay. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of a hard game to trailer because it's just about you are, you know, in a cult and managing all these different resources and crazy things are happening to you. But yeah, if I were to make a trailer about a game like this, maybe their second trailer does this, I would have VO where you're talking about a story that's generated and like, you know, then this happened, then I got this card and and then surprise, you know, I was shocked by this horrible thing happening and then, you know, that would make it a lot clearer to the the viewer the types of things that can be generated by this game, the types of feelings that can come from it. But yeah, it's it's good to see that uh, games that try totally new stuff can be can be successful on Steam. I think uh, indies can take heart from this this sort of thing. People always talk about how it's, you know, hit driven business, but I if you keep your team size small and you make something really cool and unique, you can survive. Look, and I think sometimes people get upset because they make a game that they think is 
you know, unique and special and it doesn't succeed. But I think that just means that you need to get better at analyzing the markets, feeling where the zeitgeist is, things like that. You know, the, the type of things that we do on, on the Clark Tank. Yeah, and Alexis is a super smart guy. Uh, he did a really good talk at GDC um, last year or the year before, talking about building indie studios. But there's all kinds of um, good tips in there. I learned a lot from it as well. So thanks, Christopher, for posting the link. Um, yeah, I found that talk super informative. I recommended it to a few people, and they got a lot out of it too. So uh, totally accurate Battlegrounds. So this is more my kind of uh, new take on, on Battlegrounds. Uh, look, June didn't have that many, you know, May had quite a few, June not too many, and then July, nothing. Ah, uh, July has two weeks of Steam sale, good points, Drek. And yeah, there may be somewhat of a natural dip just in summer. People don't want to launch right before the sale, too, before the sale. Uh, all right, this is the police we talked about. Oh, this is the police, too. Yeah, we talked about the, um, the original. Oh, let's check this out. Why am I here, Lily? This voice actor is really going for it. Because you've gotten to it. Gameplay, look at it. Yeah, that is a interesting decision to go with like a minute and a half of dude yelling, why am I here uh, at the start of your trailer? Hmm, so it's done reasonably well. This title, like I think game titles are extremely important, um, obviously. And this is the police, like it's, it sticks with you. And I'm amazed that there wasn't a game called This is the Police ever before. You hear it so many times in movies and stuff before they kick in the door or whatever. Uh, it's a very well known phrase and gives you immediate uh, associations with many other things. So very strong, strong title. Uh, and yeah, it looks like it's avoiding the sequel curse. So we've talked about this uh, before that a lot of indie games sort of struggle uh, when they try to make a sequel uh, and uh, it's usually because the first game succeeded because it had a cool concept that had never been done before. And then in the second game, well, it's been done already and they kind of know what it's like. Um, so doing the same thing again, the same thing but a bit more or a bit different, doesn't always work. It looks like they, they did change quite a lot, uh, adding in the tactical uh, gameplay. Um, and if your game is the type of game where people get to the end of it and they want more of it, like narrative games where they're like, I want to hear more of the story. Those types of things I think can work better as sequels. This did reasonably well. The universe sim uh, is interesting to me because I'm into sim games. I uh, don't think I've seen this trailer yet. I do think this is a viable genre if anyone's interested in sim games. Uh, there was an older game called Reyes that, uh, that did quite well um, in this genre despite being, you know, a somewhat um, molded together in the simple sim fabric of space. Yeah, it seems kind of populous-ish. Look at that UFO. <laughs> you got to do the boar. <laughs> Look at that big monster. So now, is that monster actually in the game? I'm impressed. It's a super cool uh, concept and trailer and stuff. So yeah, Chinese parents has been talked about a lot. It's super cool to see this. Uh, you know, more and more games from China succeeding. China is huge for sure. Uh, Pummel Party, this is an interesting one. Let's watch this. So yeah, this is uh, the kind of game that I was talking about where streamers can play it with the other streamer friends and then, you know, do horrible things to each other and laugh and, and scream at each other. So uh, Lethal League Blaze. Interestingly, they didn't call it Lethal League 2. Oberdin, there it is. 2,000 something reviews since October is crazy for this style of game. It's just because it's such a well done, clever concept made so well. And another hospital game, Steam can support two hospital sims in one year, even though it released after two point. Yeah, and still reasonably successful. So good to see. All right, let's quickly go through most played. So this is the highest peak simultaneous players. Of course, PUBG, a bunch of Royale games, TF2. Over 100,000, uh, Dota, CSGO, Warframe, yeah, all those are not too surprising. So No Man's Sky, when they did a big update, Gary's mod, seriously? Stardew, Stellaris, I'm a bit surprised that Stellaris would have that many simultaneous users. Subnautica had a ton of users as well, good to see. Dead by Daylight, still going strong. Slay the Spire, wow, over 25,000. It's, it's surprising to me with games like that and Stellaris where it's not the type of game that you, you know, play with your friends like Gary's Mod or Payday or something. 
Um, you're mostly just playing it by yourself, but I, I suppose their retention is so high that when people start a session, uh, they're going to play for quite a while. Chinese parents, even that gets really high, simultaneous number of players. I wonder what the retention is like on that game. Frostpunk. So yeah, Frostpunk, you know, I would assume that it's somewhat similar to Stellaris in terms of retention. Although, yeah, its play sessions are not, not quite as long as Stellaris's. Gungeon. Hmm, must have been when they did a big update or something. Now, For Honor was big for a while back in 2017, but still uh, still hanging around. For Honor was a free weekend? Oh, yeah, that... Thanks for the info track, as usual. That could definitely change things. I wonder if Valve took that into account when making this, you know, because... Yeah, they are billions, a little lower than I would have expected. I think in my mind I must have um, ascribed more success to this game than it really had. 11,000 reviews in a year-ish is, is huge. Um, but yeah, I thought it was even even more successful than that. But yeah, that's the uh, beginning of the year stuff. All right, and the other cool thing that happened, somehow people figured out that, uh, I guess because of a new thing that Sony did, where you can post these videos about your PS4 life, the things that you've been doing, and on there it can show, it can show how many people own certain trophies and then on playstation.com it shows the percentage of users users that earn those trophies so if you know the absolute number and you know the percentage then you can figure out the total number of users and so some clever uh enterprising person uh figured that out and then started finding all of those videos that people were posting i think they're just like looking for them the tag on social media and finding them and looking in the videos this would be a very manual process to, to find those uh numbers uh, but let's take a look at what we can learn from this uh, treasure trove of data here. Uh, so yeah, the biggest game, hey, big surprise, GTA 5, just like it has been on Steam. Uh, but Black Ops 3, not far behind, that's a bit surprising. Uh, Fortnite, <laughs> and, and, and the, these numbers for Fortnite, you know, they're all this year. And then this FIFA stuff is super interesting. Like, look at this year over year growth. But yeah, FIFA, man. It's just a license to print money. Rocket League was free at launch on PS Plus? Oh. So players does not equal owners. That is a good point, Quixote. Thank you. Rainbow Six Siege has also had free weekends. Ah, that could explain it. Yeah, it's hard to draw conclusions about any of this stuff because unless we know if it's been free on PS Plus, otherwise we're making incorrect assumptions about the viability of certain types of games and certain genres, so... So yeah, shame. This is interesting data, but not um, as actionable. All right, moving on. So yeah, I just wanted to quickly touch on Discord announcing uh, December 14th that their store was going to be so 90% for devs and 10% for Discord. You got to believe that this is uh, Epic's doing. Great for developers. Uh, you know, if more and more stores start doing these sorts of things, that'd be, it'd be great for us. Uh, thanks, Epic, for uh, for starting that trend. All right, let's quickly do our Steam Top 50 homework. This, in case you are new here, this is a view of uh, what was in the Top 50 on Steam over the last 24 hours. Um, so let's just look for anything new in here. Uh, okay, Atlas. We saw Atlas in some of the charts, and I am not actually that familiar with it. So let's uh, let's check this out. So this is like an MMO. Supposedly with really huge worlds, right? Like 40,000 people. Wow, there was just a snake on that uh, boardwalk there. And you're always puzzled why the, the reviews, low low review score t uh, games manage to top the charts. Yeah, I think it's just because when someone does like the game, they're probably quite likely to tell their friend about it. Their, their, the retention on these types of games is generally quite high. Wow, look at those big waves. That's super cool. That horse just... Look at that horse. This trailer has it all. Like, this is... This is the most epic content-wise trailer I think I've ever seen, maybe since No Man's Sky. The game is nothing like the trailer. <laughs> well, well, that's hence the negative reviews. Like, holy smoke, 17,000 reviews since December 22nd. However, whenever there's controversial games, the review there's more reviews than there would normally be for that number of units sold because people really want to complain about it. So yeah, it says in the same world. So I would be pissed if I bought this and you actually can, so it's 201 region. Yeah, that's not the same. So world, I suppose. All right, the raft, it was in a lot of those charts. It's, 
it's sticking around the top sellers charts despite being not being on sale and it came out in may like this is pretty impressive gary's mod why are you so high in the charts gary's mod it's medieval kingdom wars came out recently let's check this out well the, it's good to see that games like this that don't have top-notch graphics like the graphics are nice but they're not you know top top quality uh, can still do well the gameplay the must just century, really be interesting but yeah it just left early access so when did it actually launch so if it's if it's had a thousand reviews since the third of january that would be bonkers but uh if it's a thousand reviews since whenever it came out of early access then that's uh, for when it entered early access uh, all right, Beat Saber is still in the charts. It's crazy that a uh, VR game is just hanging around. It's, it's so cool. Yeah, it doesn't look like there's too many new releases. Parkitect, that's cool to see in the, in the charts. Made by some local Vancouver folks here. All right. Yeah, I think that's most of the uh, surprising stuff. So, top wish lists. This was discovered recently. Um, and we still don't know exactly what it means uh so where is titan here's industries of titan yay grip lands. oh they put up a store page cool that's a new game coming out from clay uh so far from other devs that i've talked to it seems like this chart is a snapshot of like maybe the last 24 hours or 12 hours or something like that of which games gathered which unreleased games gathered the most wish, wish lists um so Titan does pretty well, gets... Uh, yeah, I'm a bit surprised that things like Forager, you'd get more wishlist than Titan. Nothing against Forager, but this is unsurprising uh, that it's at the top of the charts because it's available for pre-order now. So maybe some people are wishlisting it instead of pre-ordering it. I assume it's available for pre-order because it's on sale. Yeah, it's on the top sellers chart, so it must be. Uh, but yeah, anyway, it's a good one to keep an eye on to see what people are hyped about uh, that is that is going to release soon. Uh, and then we also look at new and trending. Medieval Kingdom Wars, that's the one we just talked about. Frostrunner, this is a free-to-play game. Adam RPG, post-apocalyptic indie game. Garden Paws. Huh, is it an uh, indie simulation? I wonder if it's a uh, rancher. All right, uh... Nothing too surprising there. We always take a look at the uh, histogram, also known as the hypestogram, to see uh, how new releases or how many new games have been launching recently. A whole bunch launched like right before Christmas break, basically. And then these numbers are all way lower than they normally would be. Um, we should see them returning back to, you know, their 20 something uh, levels soon, I bet. All right, so this is the uh, moving average of that of the number of games that are released uh on steam it's maintained by harbor pirate thank you harbor for doing that uh and so now we have a new color on here yellow is 2019 uh so 2019 starting off lower than 2018 started off but higher than 2017 so don't know what uh, that means exactly but 2018 actually ended lower than uh 2019 and like look 2018 was actually lower for a lot of the fall than 2017. There's always doom and gloom about how many games are being launched and how horrible it is the sky is falling because t there's tons of competition these days. But I actually think that it's either plateauing or maybe even declining. Because look, 2018 and 2017 are not that different. And if anything, 2018 was lower. And 2019 is starting lower than 2018 did. So, you know, at worst, we're pretty flatline. And at best, I think it may be starting to decline. It is possible, though, that, sure, maybe we're not being flooded by uh, games anymore. But it is possible that the quality of the games, you know, the actual level of competition is going up. But that is why we look at Steam trailers, Steam micro trailers. But the, the reason why we do this is that we can get a really quick sense for the quality of the games that we're up against. It's not scientific by any stretch, but you know, if every game that we saw in the micro trailers was super high quality on par with the types of games that we make, then I might start to get scared, you know? Huh, hey, a side view, side view cart game, that's unusual. Go cabbies. Oh, is this a German style game? Uh, Steel Life. Oh. 
This seems to be a big fish casual game style adventure game. Space Ribbon. Whoa, it's like Mario Kart. That's what I thought that other kart game was going to be. Anyway, uh, there you go. That's that's the type of competition we're up against. You know, some of these games are definitely, you know, high quality games. But I don't think that, uh, you know, the quality level seems to have changed over the last few years or so. So yeah, so far so good. All right, real quick, let's do the Kickstarter report. Uh, and then we'll play some Grease. All right, one step from Eden. This is new. A deck building action roguelike inspired by Mega Man Battle. Okay. I have to watch that now. You said all, a lot of my favorite things. Okay, so it is action. It did say action. I'm a bit surprised. Yeah, it seems cool. It's not what I was expecting. That was like fast-paced action. Now it's time to get to some... some grease. Man. Ooh. Ouch. Who animates this stuff? kind of wizard it's so expressive it's crazy it's not many indie games that do like these upfront credits the way that some movies do which uh, it's kind of cool um, it, it makes it feel more like a movie which you know a game that's it's so heavily about the visuals it's it's pretty clever it makes it feel more epic too music by Berlinist I'm digging the tunes there's a square. Grease. Watch out. Oh. She snapped out of it. Oh, she can jump. Floaty thing, get. Oh, it moves like a, like constellations. Oh, we go up. Oh, okay. So that's one of the mechanics of this game is that you can kind of change planes. That's, uh, I was not expecting that. Look at that. It's like her skirts flowing in the same way. Uh, and yeah, in general, you would expect that this genre is difficult to succeed in. So when games do succeed, you gotta wonder why and what, what is it about it. And obviously this one, it's the art is astounding, the audio is great. Um, and you know, this is the kind of game that used to succeed back in, you know, the early IGF days where it would just be, you know, uh, a side view, a side scroller game, but you know something about the art or the story or the theme really made it special. Uh, and for a while, it seemed like those types of games weren't viable, but maybe it just wasn't. We just didn't have the right one. You know, this this level of uh, beauty in the art and music is what it takes, I suppose. It's obviously an art, and you know audio and mood first kind of game. Not that the gameplay is suffering, but the gameplay is very light. There's no, there hasn't been any sort of challenge yet. Yeah, I suppose it could have been oversaturation. Although I, I feel like my, my theory on these sorts of things is that people who play these games, you know, they don't, they don't play a game like Greece as their you know, speed run it over and over again. You know, I'm sure some people do, but it's most people don't. They just play it for you know a few hours or however long it take however long it takes to beat it, and then they move on to another game. So, you know, if they're into this style of game, you would think that they would then move on to another game of this style if there are any to be had. Whoa, that was all like an intro sequence. <laughs> I like it. They did the intro credits thing. And then they did this. That is, um, that's neat. All right. I think we're going to, I think we're going to wrap things up there. It's difficult to learn too much from this because one game, you know, succeeding, you know, one indie side-scrolling game succeeding doesn't necessarily mean that it's viable now. And, um, also it has like pretty unparalleled art and audio. So, and even if you did something like this, uh, it may not succeed. So these types of games, obviously they can work, but um, I find them hard to predict. If you were considering making something like that, it's it's still, it's obviously still viable, but yeah, difficult and you, things, your work needs to be top notch for sure in order to have this, this type of success. Make, uh, yeah, but I think that's gonna wrap it up for uh, this Clark Tank. 
Thanks so much for watching, everyone. See you in four weeks. This Clark Tank is over.